Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melody Barnes, and I am thrilled that you are all joining us here digitally this afternoon. I was President Obama's first domestic policy advisor, and since I left the White House, I now wear several different hats. I'm a vice provost at New York University, and I'm thrilled to say that they are hosting us this afternoon. And I'm also a senior fellow at Results for America, or RFA. RFA was founded in 2012, and they focus on evidence-based policymaking. Now, I know for a number of you that sounds really exciting in and of itself. For some of you, you're thinking, why should I keep watching? But let me say this about evidence-based policymaking. If you care about families, if you care about your community, if you care about the country, then you have to care about this issue because this issue tells us the best way that we can go about improving our communities and our country and indeed the world using what works to actually make those changes come into fruition. This afternoon, we're going to focus on RFA's approach to the issue of economic mobility. Now, their approach involves bringing together a bipartisan coalition of leaders, including government leaders, that are focusing on a policy agenda. And because we all care so much about, eco about economic mobility, and we all know that this is an issue that our country is struggling with right now, and in fact has remained stagnant, we also know that we have to focus on those tools, those innovations that are going to make economic mobility actually uh, viable. We're going to bring that kind of change to our community and to our country. Specifically, we're going to focus on the issue of SNAP and SNAP incentives this afternoon. Now, these are income tools that are used to make sure that those who are living in communities across the country actually have access to the best foods, the healthiest foods and vegetables available to them. Many of you may have seen the issue of SNAP in the news recently, and one of the things we are going to talk about a little bit later is the fact that because we know that SNAP works, that SNAP incentives work, that we have to ensure that those who are leading our policy conversations today, those candidates that want to lead us in the future are being fact-checked when they're talking about this issue. We're going to start off with a wonderful conversation with Aaliyah Collins, who's here to my right. And Aaliyah is going to tell us about her personal experience with SNAP incentives and how they've actually changed her life and that of her son and over the course of her engagement with SNAP incentives. And then we're going to turn to a panel of experts who are going to add even more meat to the bones, bring the data and the evidence that I was just talking about a few minutes ago to light. But first, I want to welcome Aaliyah, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. No problem. Thank you. And Aaliyah, I want to first start off by get, having you give our audience a sense of who you are. If you could give us a little bit of insight onto your background and why healthy food and vegetables became important to you. Um, I am a disabled uh, Navy vet. I'm a single mom to my son who's two. His my name is Octavius. Um, I became interested in uh, healthy foods just by, uh, you know, becoming a vegetarian as a child and then as I got older eating, you know, just trying to eat more healthier. Um, when I became in, when I was in the Navy, I became sick and I didn't want to be on meds anymore. So I looked to um, the Earth's resources to heal me and to keep me uh, viable and being able to you know go to school and just being able to function on a daily basis. Um, I came to start you know using SNAP when I had custody of my little sister and in the military. And I had uh, actually made $20 too much money mm. to, to actually get food stamps or SNAP. So when we got out of the military, that was the first place that I went because I went from, you know, literally making 80 grand a year as an E5 um, to making zero. Mm. So that, it really helped with, you know, bridging the gap of whether or not we had, you know, good food or mm. we were eating McDonald's. Um, now it's come to, um, I have a two-year-old, and mm -hmm. I've used SNAP and I've used WIC, uh, especially throughout my pregnancy, um, to, to make sure that I was able to get some, um, you know, uh, organic food mm -hmm. or, or uh, great, you know, good foods yeah, for me. Fresh fruits. Fresh mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables, beans. 
Uh, but uh, it wasn't until uh, I was able to um, actually, I wasn't able to stretch it as much. It's very hard to stretch it. So it's, you know, it's been difficult, but you know, you do it in however way you can. Well, it, and it sounds like your knowledge about the importance of healthy foods and vegetables goes back quite a ways because mm -hmm. it was imp literally imp a matter of your well-being and your ability to function and to do your job. Right. But it also sounds like it became much more difficult when you talk about that income drop that you took, you know, being a veteran, but all of a sudden having you know, fewer resources to, right. to be able to rely on. And can you tell us some about the difficulty that you found actually accessing healthy foods and vegetables? Well, when you go to Giant Safeway, they all have the organic side mm -hmm. and they have, you know, you know, uh, you know, f processed foods and everything. But when you're looking at your budget and you are you're trying to feed a, a growing teenager at the mm -hmm. time or right now going two year old, you're looking at a budget of two twenty, you're you only can really in Safeway or Giant spend about, that's about a week's worth of food. So you had to learn, I had to learn how to literally spend $50 here on this, do the $10, 10 for 10, mm -hmm. whatever. And that didn't necessarily mean that I was actually getting foods that were healthy. And I, what, I, what I mean by that, I mean, I mean like foods that didn't have like synthetic dyes, preservatives and things like that. So, um, and well, and given the challenge that you were finding, can you tell us some about the Arcadia Mobile Market? Because it sounded like that was a, a turning point for oh, you. Yeah, that was a godsend. Um, I found <laughs> found them um, through my, uh, the Health and Birth Center where I was when I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, when I was pregnant, I was only getting seventy one dollars worth of food stamps, mm. and uh, and that's seventy one dollars per month. Per month, it was mm -hmm. only 71. I went from receiving two something with me and my sister on it, and then when they when she dropped off because of her age, and I went and applied because of my uh, because of my pregnancy, it was like 70, 71 dollars per mm -hmm. month, and um, and including the WIC checks, I really found it hard after learning the the. Uh, the gist of getting through the WIC line at Giant mm -hmm. to actually do what, you know, use the WIC. Uh, there's uh, the fresh checks, the $5 fresh checks. Um, you end up with maybe a bag of green beans from the, from the fresh side and maybe some fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's not conducive to actually, you know, getting right. a meal out. Right. So um, when I found Arcadia, it was so like, I was actually able to to uh, shop from week to week instead of having to shop for the whole month mm -hmm. in one trip. Which it's hard to shop for fresh fruit and vegetables at the beginning of the month, month and expect they're gonna exactly. be fresh at the end exactly. of the month. I remember even talking to uh, Ben, one of the guys that works at Arcadia, and asking him how do I um, staunch my vegetables so that I can mm -hmm. last it, you know, mm -hmm. make them last through. But um, it, was, it was a breath of fresh air because I walked out of there and I only spent fifty dollars, but mm -hmm. I had at least a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars mm -hmm. worth of food. Even though they're doubling the food stamps, the value of what you're getting mm -hmm. is just immense. You can't you can't beat it with a bat. You know? And let's say Arcadia, that mobile market went away tomorrow. What do you think what kinds of options do you think would be available to you? My options are Aldi's, which injects their meat with 15% um, salt solutions, um, or sometimes going to Giant and Giant or Safeway and literally having to pick through the meat section and maybe get um, a lot of processed stuff, mm -hmm. quick stuff, because it's cheaper mm -hmm. and it, it'll fill up. Um, that's what we really go through during the winter months when Arcadia's not around. So. So all of a sudden, the options that you have, the accessibility um, to having healthy fruits and vegetables literally starts to dry up. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we were t I started out talking about what works. And it sounds to me like Arcadia and the mobile market, that is an example of what of good policy and good practice that is working in your life and for others in your community. Right. Uh, well, especially when you're, we're constantly battling the uh, them taking down the amount of uh, SNAP 
benefits, you get a month. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, with Arcadia, you get fresh food, I mean, fresh meats, fresh cheese, the best chocolate milk ever, <laughs> <laughs> and um, breads and um, granola that my son loves. And th these are things that I would not be able to afford going to Yes, going to... Uh, um, and Yes is a market, yes, organic and, market okay, here. Which mm -hmm. I shop at, but mm -hmm. I nitpick when I shop because I can only get what I can get. Mm -hmm. And um, Arcadia has really given me the opportunity to you know, not have to worry about hormones being in my meat. Um, that I, when I give my son something, I know that it's it's come from the it's come from the source that it said it's come from. And then I also trust them. I, I you know built a relationship with them, even though it's been through Facebook or, you know, when I go to the marketing, you know, saying hi. These are people that I trust to to take care of my food source. You know. So it sounds like all around, this has been good for your health. Mm -hmm. It's been great for it, when you were helping to raise a teenager, great for your two-year-old son, but also in terms of the development of your community and giving you resources so that you can stretch your income a little bit further mm -hmm. um, to create greater mobility for yourself and for your family. Yeah, yes well, it has. Well, Aaliyah, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story no with us this afternoon and for being with us and helping everyone here in the audience understand and what this means, why it works, and why it's important that we have these kinds of economic and income supports. So thank you so much. No problem. It's thank a you. real pleasure. Really and good you. luck to you and your two-year-old. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm excited about the fact that we have a wonderful panel that's joining us that are, will continue to add to what Aaliyah just told us. And sitting with me, um, first we have uh, Lindsay, Haynes Maddow, Maslow, who is with the Union of Concerned Scientists. We also have John Weedman, who's the Deputy Executive Director of the Food Trust, and Pam Hess, who's with the Arcadia Center. So thank you all for joining us and joining our audience this afternoon as well. Thank it's you. a real pleasure. Thank you. And I want to start out with you, Lindsay. We just heard Aaliyah tell us in a very clear way why SNAP incentives are so important. But I was wondering if you could pull back a little bit and put this in context and for our audience explain the SNAP program so they understand what we're building on with SNAP incentives. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again for having me here today. Um, I just want to say my background, I've done almost a decade now in obesity prevention, focusing on access to healthy foods, um, primarily in lower income populations. A lot of these populations are also on SNAP. And SNAP is a vital federal food assistance program. This was actually piloted in the 1960s by President Kennedy and then later signed into law by President Johnson. In 2009, President Obama actually expanded the benefits to try and help people that were still suffering and struggling from the economic downturn. Now, what we've heard before is that you know, the primary goal of SNAP is actually to alleviate hunger and food insecurity. Now, the great thing about SNAP is that it is a means-tested program. That means if you actually are eligible for it, you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. And in this country, if you are a household whose income is less than 130% of the federal poverty level and you pass an asset test, you're going to be eligible. Now, some states have chosen to expand eligibility so they can actually cover more individuals in their, in their state. Um, the average monthly benefit per household is it's only $250 a month. <laughs> so um, as you've heard from Aaliyah, it's not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do know that even the little amount that it has been giving, um, the studies on SNAP and the impact that it has on food insecurity, it's pretty promising. Um, there are estimates that once a family goes on SNAP, it reduces their food insecurity by 30%. Um, in the past several decades, there have been a lot of research on the health impacts of SNAP. We see that adults and children, they have better mental health outcomes. They have better um, physical health outcomes. So that means they're able to go to work. Um, they are not having to take missed days. And if they need to go to the doctor, they actually go and they are able to get the, the help that they need. And for kids, we know they perform better in school. Oh, yes. No, definitely. Absolutely. And that's um, one of the 
a really great aspect of the SNAP program is that kids can get what they need to function in school. Um, now, in terms of how much does this program actually cost, mm -hmm. um, some more thinking uh, nationwide. Uh, last year, there were over um, $75 billion that went out in benefits. And these served about 47 million lower income households. And again, the great thing is, is that even with those $75 billion, we are seeing that at least the outcomes in food insecurity, they're getting better. Mm -hmm. I, that's a great context for our mm -hmm. conversation. And you answered a lot of the questions that people are often asking. How much does this cost, mm -hmm. cost and what are the benefits? Mm -hmm. And some of those benefits are um, in productivity, oh, yeah. um, better health, health outcomes, and mm -hmm. we know what health what healthcare costs cost the nation as a whole today. Yeah. So all of that is being shrunk while we're seeing people be more productive at work and at mm -hmm. school. So John, I want to turn to you. So yes. we've talked a little bit about SNAP. Uh, Leah started talking about SNAP incentives. And I'm wondering, given the work that you do at the Food Trust and the amount of research that you all do, but also the work that you all do on the ground, if you can also give us some context around the issue of SNAP incentives and tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, sure, I'd love to. Yeah, SNAP incentives uh, are, are really uh, great. Um, you know, put simply, uh, these are coupons that food stamp participants can use to uh, receive additional fresh fruits and vegetables. So the goal here is making the healthy choice uh, the easy choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, it was sort of a dream project for us. We launched our program five years ago in partnership with Mayor Nutter in Philadelphia uh, called Philly Food Bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically every um, time a food stamp customer spends $5, they get an additional $2 Philly Food Bucks that can be used for fruits and vegetables. Uh, it's been tremendously popular, tremendously successful. It's, it's dramatically increased the number of uh, food stamp customers that are coming to farmers markets. Um, and we're also now coupling the program in Philly with cooking demonstrations. So uh, customers can see and uh, you know, learn a new recipe and then use the SNAP incentive to purchase the ingredients. So, Which it sounds terrific because often people look at, you know, you get an artichoke and people are like, well, what do I do with this? But exactly. it sounds like you are not only talking about ways that we get good fruits and vegetables in people's hands and other healthy foods, but also show them how to use them. That's exactly right. And when we, you know, we collect the data and survey um, the participants in the SNAP incentive program, um, we're seeing that they are, um, you know, higher intakes of fruits and vegetables are um, recorded with the, the, the uh, participants, as well as using a greater variety, just like you said, of the artichokes, you know, uh, trying new things, which is really important. Right. Um, and now we're also really excited that at the federal level, we have the FINI program, mm -hmm. which stands for the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program. Uh, this is a you know, brand new program that was passed as part of last year's Farm Bill with bipartisan support. Um, and Can you say that again? Because <laughs> sure. it's, a, it's a phrase we don't yeah. often hear. Yeah, I practice it before this. So, <laughs> uh, it's called FINI, and it's Food Insecurative Nutrition Incentive Program. And there was bipartisan support Oh, yes, that. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, bipartisan support in Congress in the Farm Bill. Both houses um, supported this, this great idea, and it's just really a win-win for uh, both SNAP participants as well as uh, rural farmers mm -hmm. as well, which I think has really helped make this a bipartisan effort. Um, but this Finney program is really exp uh, expanding these efforts that were really, the idea was hatched at farmers markets. Mm -hmm. um, so this is going to allow for many more of these types of programs to happen around the country at farmers markets. And also now USDA is allowing to try some uh, of these strategies in supermarkets and in corner stores. So we're really excited at the Food Trust um, to take our Philly Food Bucks program statewide Wide. Um, we've already um, launched it in Pittsburgh at farmers markets, and then we're also going to be working with a supermarket and a corner store later this year. And how popular is this at farmers markets, for example, and on in those corner stores? Is it, well, we haven't tried it yet in mm -hmm. corner stores, um, but we have a network in Philadelphia of over 600 corner stores that are part of our healthy corner store network. Mm -hmm. So those stores have opted now to sell uh, additional fresh fruits and vegetables, and we think this uh, Finney, or the, the Philly Food Bucks in our case, mm -hmm. um, is going to really help support those efforts. At the farmer's markets, it's incredibly popular, and the cooking demos, which we launched mm -hmm. this year, have been wildly successful. Crowds are coming out to the market, you know, um, watching a, the cooking demonstration and then going over and buying stuff from the farmers. Because often what I hear is, 
oh, I don't know if low-income people are going to want to go to farmers markets, or they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily care about having access to these kinds of fruits and vegetables. And what you're saying is it's wildly popular, and it has the win-win effect of not only are people getting access, but local farmers and producers are able to sell their goods. So there's the economic development component to this mixed with the, with the access issue. That's exactly right. And we operate 27 farmers markets. We've been running farmers markets for the last 20, uh, the last 20 years. Um, but we have markets in some of the you know, highest um, rates of poverty in the entire country, places in North Philadelphia. Farmers markets are very successful and popular. And Pam, I want to bring you into this conversation. We, we heard from Aaliyah, who's a customer, mm -hmm. um, and you know that's the kind of customer you want, a satisfied uh, customer who's <laughs> talking about the importance of the work that you do. And I was wondering if you could tell our audience how Arcadia fits into the, the conversation that we've been having today. Sure, I think it's sort of an interesting cascade we have here. We have very high-minded Lindsay and then the food <laughs> trust is there up in Philly. We are very much the, the tip of the sword in food access in Washington, D.C. Arcadia, the Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture, we have two mobile markets. One is a school bus, one is an Isuzu box truck. Together they make 19 regular weekly stops in low food access neighborhoods. High use of SNAP, low car ownership, no grocery store for at least a mile around. Mm -hmm. um, the impact that we have on Washington is pretty profound in, in low income Washington. Most of the farmers markets in DC are a huge business. This is a food mad town. Mm -hmm. um, 12 to 15 million dollars, I think, is, is uh, the revenue that farmers markets generate. We're just a tiny percentage of that, only about 2%, maybe even less than that total revenue. But we represent 25% of all food stamps that are used at farmers markets in Washington are used with us in our 19 farmers markets. Um, the, the impact that we have is huge because we actually locate ourselves, like you do, in neighborhoods that otherwise don't have access to food. One of the, um, uh, one of the, we have a lot of markers that I'm, I'm really proud of in this, if we're talking about <laughs> evidence base. When you say that people don't want this food, people want this food. The first year we were out, our average SNAP transaction was about $8. It's now up to about $18. Um, the 43.5% uh, of our customers' transactions are with people who are using some form of food assistance. Mm -hmm. the, and, and most of the people that are coming to the markets are living in the neighborhoods where we are. So we know that they're low income because that's where we locate ourselves. Um, I have no problem uh, selling out our bus. It, it, mm -hmm. it, generally, it's, it's by the end of the week, all of the food that we have is gone and we're back out to the local farmers. And when you talk about the economic mm -hmm. impact, that's part of the work that we do. Um, we are about changing the food system and creating a more equitable and sustainable food system. And that means that without the farmers, you don't have a food system. So we pay our farmers a fair price for the food, and then we get it into the neighborhoods where people don't otherwise have access to it. And we have a bonus bucks program like Market Match. We match dollar for dollar. Um, I think we'll be spending about $40,000 this year matching the, the SNAP sales and the WIC and Farmer's Market Nutrition vouchers on the, on the bus. It's, um, I, 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 I want people to come and tell me that this doesn't work because it absolutely does. When we are trying to yeah, get... Yeah, I can see you're vibrating yeah, with it. <laughs> when we're trying to get people, when, when we want to get people to eat healthy food, I mean, what we're up against is an entrenched uh, processed food system that uses convenience and price and ubiquity and um, great graphic artists on the outside to really make this stuff seem desirable. And we have to compete on that same level. And so we put ourselves in the neighborhoods where people are. We make it affordable through um, SNAP incentives. We make it desirable by having um, cooking demonstrations. We give everybody who shops at our market for the first time um, who's using federal nutrition benefits a copy of our um, self-published cookbook, which is critically acclaimed and incredible. <laughs> um, we have to both meet the demand and build the demand. Um, these neighborhoods we've been in have not had access to fresh food in some cases for 30 years, so people don't necessarily know what they're getting. And, 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 and I, I think it's important for people to stop and to pause and to think about that. Especially me. <laughs> no, because not had access to healthy foods for 30 years. And John, just a second, I'm gonna come back to you to talk about food deserts and what you all are doing to address this issue. But I think it, it's important to underscore that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and you touched on it a few minutes ago, is the fact that you are taking food into communities. Because often, you know, many of us, we you know, hop, on, hop in our car, mm -hmm. or it may be a metro stop or, or two to get to what we're, uh, 
what we need or within walking distance, but we're talking about multiple bus stops, mm -hmm. not having a car because you can't afford a car. So there's a transportation element that you are bringing into, that you're connecting to the food piece. Of and it. there's a cost with the transportation. If you want to take the metro from Ward 8 to DuPont Circle, you're looking at about $6 round trip. That's 25% right. of your entire food budget. And then you're going to go and pay some pretty steep farmer's market prices. I, I, the, the food is beautiful and the farmers deserve every penny, but it's out of reach for a lot of people. And so to look at that and say, well, those people aren't shopping at that market, therefore they don't want this food, it's, it's an unfactual argument. We right. know that if you provide convenience and affordability, and it has to be high quality, because people know what's good and what's bad, and they're willing to spend their money on high quality. When you meet all of those tests, then you, then you sell out your bus. By the well, end of the it underscores what we're talking about here, data, and evidence. Mm -hmm. and John, I do want to come back to you and talk about the work that you all are doing at Food Trust to eliminate food deserts. Uh, and for those who are watching, I'm sure many people know, I mean, we're talking about places with, you know, within a few miles, there is literally no access to healthy foods and vegetables. Right, and we've been doing this work for about 20 years now, mm -hmm. and um, you know, we, we got our start really doing um, nutrition education in schools and farmers markets in Philadelphia, uh, and now we work nationally, and we really believe that what's needed to, uh, you know, to improve access to healthy food and to address some of the health disparities that exist in low-income communities um, is sort of a comprehensive approach that includes both education and access. Uh, so we're, we're fortunate to work in Pennsylvania through a program called SNAP-Ed, which provides um, nutrition education programming, which has had a huge impact. Um, but also, we do a lot with community access. So I've already been talking about our, our farmer's market network. Um, and then we've also been working nationally on grocery store access. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, the key to these programs, um, which you're seeing at the state and local level, and also now at the federal level, the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, which is really targeting eliminating healthy food access, uh, uh, eliminating food deserts, um, is public-private partnership. So mm -hmm. it's government, the nonprofit sector, and businesses like grocers, like farmers, uh, and like uh, convenience store and bodega owners, which we're also right. working with as well. Um, and we found by working with the food retailers um, that a modest incentive, a one-time grant and loan, uh, can be all it takes to really catalyze investment and bring a grocery store back mm -hmm. to a urban area or a rural community as well. Right. A lot of people don't realize food deserts right. exist in rural America. <laughs> yeah, that was a you know that was a learning for us uh, mm -hmm. doing this work in Pennsylvania. We started focusing on Philadelphia's food deserts. Um, but we, with the Pennsylvania Fresh Food Financing Initiative, we found um, the same problem was in, in rural communities as well. That program helped fund uh, 88 healthy food retail projects across the state, many in rural areas, mm -hmm. created 5,000 jobs. Um, and that model uh, is now spread in, in various you know, states and cities like New Orleans, New York, mm -hmm. uh, Ohio just uh, launched a program. Um, and thanks to the leadership of the President and the First Lady in Congress, we have the Federal Healthy Food Financing Initiative now, which has taken this model mm -hmm. nationwide, which is really exciting. And uh, we have a website called the Healthy Food Access Portal at, at healthyfoodaccess.org. So say that again. Okay. <laughs> uh, healthyfoodaccess.org. Okay. Um, that's a great kind of one-stop shop to learn all all about all these different um, food desert success stories and mm -hmm. the, the case studies of grocery stores and farmers markets and corner stores that are popping up in these areas that have been without for so many years and doing, uh, you know, very successful. Well, and Lindsay, I'm coming back to you, or as Pam mm -hmm. called you, our high-minded Lindsay, <laughs> <laughs> um, because we've talked about food deserts, we've talked about taking fresh mm -hmm. food into communities. And we've touched on the fact that this is also a job creator, an economic um, mm -hmm. development stimulator. Wonder if you could talk a little bit about the public health outcomes and what we see as public health benefits from these kinds of programs from SNAP incentives. Yeah, I mean, so in this day and age right now, I think we all know that it is expensive and it is difficult to have a healthy behavior. Mm -hmm. um, it's challenging. And I know when I go to the grocery store, my husband and I together spend well over $100 a week. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think about someone on SNAP who receives probably in a household average $60 a week, 
I can't imagine what it would take to be trying to figure out how are you going to make those food dollars last? How are you going to create healthy, tasty meals that you and your family will eat? Because I think you said, Pam, some people haven't seen this type of food in 30 years, and their kids probably don't like it just yet. Mm -hmm. um, but with cooking classes and nutrition education and demos, these programs can be fairly successful, and especially when they're coupled with these incentive programs. Um, in this country, uh, sadly, we know that a lot of lower income communities have higher rates of obesity, they have more chronic disease, and they also have less access to fresh, healthy food. Uh, when I was in North Carolina, I did a lot of research in 2010 and 2011 going out to lower income communities and I spoke with over 100 lower income women about uh, what do they do to, to survive this world and how do they provide for their families and a lot of these women were on SNAP and they said, you know, the program is great, uh, it really helps me first couple weeks of the month. Mm -hmm. um, and even then, I'm looking at different stores. I see these really nice grocery stores that I want to buy high quality, you know, organic produce or something that's safe for me and my family. But then I look at my, my voucher and it's not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. So what they are doing, um, these, are, these are smart and they are savvy shoppers. They are looking at deals. They're cutting coupons. They're going to multiple stores. They're buying in bulk. Uh, the one interesting thing about a lot of research and data on SNAP um, is with the nutritional quality of uh, diets right now on SNAP participants. That's been a question that's been asked a couple times. What well, was SNAP great enough to improve the nutritional quality of their diets? Mm -hmm. The answer is we, we don't know yet. Um, there's been so this limited... is a place where we need more data, more yes, information. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the more recent studies that have come out, um, they've been limited, uh, they've been uh, inconcise, and in that I think one reason is we're finding that through stories like Aaliyah and stories through my qualitative research that these incentives are not enough to actually cover the cost of a healthy diet that's going to sustain you and your family. Um, so what you said, more data and more evidence would be great for researchers so we can really figure out what works with this program. And one of the things I want to say about the work mm -hmm. that Results for America and others who are focused on evidence-based policymaking are yeah. doing is saying we have to build, uh, mm -hmm. we have to build evidence, and that's a constant process. So mm -hmm. it isn't as though we know the answer to all of our questions, no. but the things that we do know the answer to, let's act on it and let's continue mm -hmm. to iterate on this. Let's continue to build evidence so that we can adjust policy mm -hmm. accordingly. Okay. Um, one question I have for you: when you were talking about. Um, cost, and I was wondering if you can give us a ballpark cost on mm -hmm. the amount of preventable obesity if we are encouraging and supporting tools that encourage healthy fruits and yeah. vegetables. I mean, right, right now in this country, I mean, the costs of obesity are just, they're unreal. Mm -hmm. um, you are seeing that obesity is a risk factor for many chronic diseases, mm -hmm. um, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, which Heart disease is actually the number one killer of men and women in the United States. Um, so right now, our best estimates are that each year we have about $210 billion that are spent on obesity-related health care costs. $210 billion. And these are just health care costs. So right. this doesn't look at mm -hmm. also sometimes productivity that, you know, what would I, how could I work in my job if I was healthy and I felt good, you know, eight hours of the day? Or, right. So these are things that are hard to actually put a number on, so that's the best what we can do. Um, when you talk about other costs, um, the economist that I work with at the Union of Concerned Scientists, mm -hmm. he actually uh, looked at the number of what would, it, what would happen if we were actually eating enough fruits and vegetables. So if Americans ate the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables that are um, given to us by the American mm -hmm. um, the Dietary Guidelines, we would probably save about $17 billion a year in cardiovascular-related mm -hmm. uh, health care costs. Mm -hmm. So cardiovascular disease, it's it's highly correlated with obesity, and I think you've already mentioned this. Um, obesity is, is highly preventable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when people talk about the importance of eating a healthy diet, mm -hmm. we have to think about the cost, literally, when we don't. And also yeah. the benefit, as we said, job creation um, and greater productivity and mm -hmm. local producers who are making money by producing the, the goods that we ought to be consuming. So 
there's a clear win on one side and there are clear costs on the other. Mm -hmm. uh, Pam, I'm wondering as we talk about, we've talked a little bit about data and evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this isn't the part where people should turn this off. This, no, this, this is, is interesting. So exciting this this is so exciting. <laughs> See Pam vibrating again. Um, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about that here. And I want you to tell us, you told us about the great work that you do, mm -hmm. how you go about tracking um, and collecting data and evidence based on the work that Arcadia is doing? Well, for the first three years, we were, like every other farmer's market, very pencil and paper based. Um, we knew generally what people were buying by looking in the truck at the end of the day and looking in the cash drawer. This year, we have introduced with a um, software partner that came in and has donated a, um, a lot of their time to us, a mobile point of sale system that I want to get into your farmer's markets. Okay. It's <laughs> iPad based and it, and, and it tracks every single purchase and links it to the kind of tender that's used. This is for data nerds, this is the most exciting thing going. USDA doesn't even know what people who use SNAP are buying, certainly at farmer's markets, and in general, this, mm -hmm. this data is pretty hard to come by from the Grocery Manufacturers Association. But we are going to, for the first time, be able to look at when did people buy more apples? Did how they bought apples change when the price changed? Did it matter which week of the month it was? Does it matter what their location was? And we can do this for every single item that we mm -hmm. sell. We don't know what we're going to find out when we have all of this data together. Together, but I'm going to make Lindsay look at it and she's going to tell me what it means. <laughs> it's great for us because it's inventory control and it's going to make us more efficient and more responsive to our customers, but the back end data is incredible and, it's, it, and I think it's going to really change the dialogue because we can show what people on WIC are buying and on SNAP are buying. And we have a lot of customers who use WIC and SNAP and then they'll reach into their pocket and get cash. So we'll be able to see what that multiplier is by offering a SNAP incentive at the mm -hmm. farmer's market. Is somebody then reaching into their pocket and pulling out 10 more dollars because this is such a great deal, they want to buy more. Mm -hmm. um, and the impact that it has on the local farm economy is huge. Every $100,000 worth of food that we sell, about $70,000 of that ends up in the pocket of a local farmer who then turns mm -hmm. around and spends that in the, uh, in, the, in the local economy, buying food for their own family, buying um, equipment and, and expanding their farms. It's, it's a, just a multiplier all the way across the board. And with $75 billion in SNAP, this is an economic engine that can be um, shackled and, and turned into something really wonderful mm -hmm. for our farm economy. Um, we just need to shift how everyone eats, not just low-income people, but how everyone eats mm -hmm. in this country to healthy and ideally locally and sustainably grown foods. Great, that's, that's terrific. And building on that and talking you know, a little bit more about data and evidence, and John, I want to talk to you about the issue of access and the work that you all are doing at the Food Trust and what you are seeing and what you are learning about the interventions that are underway in terms of creating greater access. Sure. Um, you know, we've had a long-standing commitment to research and evaluation. So we have a team, a research and evaluation team, that collects data on all of our programs. Mm -hmm. And what's great is we can then use that data to improve them and enhance the programs, um, which we do all the time. Um, and one of our best, you know, partners is the Philadelphia Health Department. They've been a great partner, helped us mm -hmm. open farmers markets, help us uh, expand our corner store network to over 600 stores. Um, they've been tracking every uh, the body mass index of every school child in Philadelphia for about mm -hmm. the past eight years. Mm -hmm. um, so using that data, we got some great news um, once they crunched the numbers a couple years ago that showed that. Finally, we're starting to see some you know, light at the tunnel, that the right. childhood obesity rates are starting to drop by about 5% in Philadelphia. Um, and again, we think this is really because Philadelphia has embarked on this very comprehensive approach using a variety of strategies mm -hmm. that includes you know, school-based education, adult education around healthy eating, uh, as well as community um, food access improvements. So bringing more grocery stores into Philadelphia, the corner store program and farmers markets and, and, and these incentives. Um, so you know, the, the, the theme is really that you know, there's not sort of a one size fits all strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really finding out sort of what works um, you know, throughout different communities that, that make up a city or make up um, the area that you're trying to work in. And one of the things we've touched, all, all of you have touched on and you've talked about children. And Lindsay, you actually spoke of most directly to this. What we know, and there's a big debate out there, it's like, oh, well, kids don't want to eat this, and they don't like it, and they throw it away. And what we are actually seeing are, as children are introduced to healthy fruits and vegetables, particularly over time, they do start to like it, if they don't mm -hmm. already. 
And they are often wonderful ambassadors going back home to their parents and introducing the same. I know I used to see kids when we, I was in the White House at the White House Garden, literally fresh cut cauliflower, and they were just like shoving it in their mouths. It was like you know, a new form of candy for them. So this is something that is not only good for you, but good and families like it, and as you've all discussed, they want it. Um, so it's, it's great to hear about ways to create more access. And Lindsay, I was wondering if you could connect some of these points for us. Um, as we've talked about food, we've talked about health, we've talked about nutrition, community development, economic mobility. And if through your research, you can, before we start to take questions um, mm -hmm. from Twitter, if you can connect some of those dots for us. Uh -huh. So one great thing about my research is that I get to delve into a little bit of each of those topics. Mm -hmm. um, the bad thing is, is that I don't <laughs> think that most of the country sees those topics as connected. Mm. So you really cannot address poverty and uh, economic mobility and nutrition and public health without trying to see them as one greater issue. Um, each of these are gonna need to be addressed in order to find a solution. Uh, Right now, the U.S. has the most expensive healthcare system in the world. Uh, we also some, have some of the worst um, health outcomes compared to any other industrialized nation. I mean, since the 1970s, our childhood obesity rates have tripled, mm -hmm. and we have 30% of youth that are actually overweight and obese. And while I think you've mentioned that some cities are starting to see a plateau in these childhood obesity rates, um, in general, the United States, we are plateauing, but also you are seeing that children of um, specific race and ethnicities are actually not plateauing. Mm -hmm. So some kids are getting much better. Most likely these are white children are having to uh, plateau and also starting to see some rising obesity rates. However, African-American and Latino children are mm -hmm. not seeing these gains. Uh, when I know we also have significant issues mm -hmm. from the work that I've done over time with Native American children as yeah. well and very high rates of of obesity. So. Oh yeah, I mean that's, I mean, mm -hmm. bringing it back to data, it's so hard to find a lot of information on Native Americans just mm -hmm. because it's such a smaller group compared mm -hmm. to others. So that, I mean, trying to get this information to use it as evidence and to figuring out how you create programs that work is just insurmountable, you mm -hmm. can't beat it. Um, but with, because of all these obesity rates and the issues with our children, we are now seeing that in our entire history, we have the first generation where we think our children are actually going to die younger than their parents. Mm. This is something that we should be doing something about. I don't, it's public health, it's housing, it's transportation, whatever we can be doing. Well, it's another form of, yeah. we always talk about the American dream, and yeah. people think about that in economic terms, which mm -hmm. is very important. But these are health outcomes. Yeah. In the same way that you want your child's life to be mm -hmm. better than yours. I think that's what every parent wants. Yeah. You literally want their health to, oh, to yeah. improve as well. Oh yeah, and I mean, with, and for lower income children too, you mm -hmm. find that they have barriers to healthy eating, healthy, healthy living that other children don't. Mm -hmm. So one big thing in, in children you see is food insecurity. Now, we talked about school a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. but when you send a, a child to school who's hungry, they're gonna be fidgeting, they're mm -hmm. not gonna pay attention, they might you know, start messing up on tests because they can't concentrate. Right. Now, as this child ages into high school, all of these poor academic performances are going to lead to a lower educational attainment. And as they get into the workforce, we all know that low educational attainment actually leads to lower paying jobs. If this child decides to, now who is adult, if they mm -hmm. want to have their own family, a lower paying job is going to make it difficult for them to provide for their own family. And the cycle is going to repeat itself again and again. So it really takes programs such as SNAP, which we know um, that it is a wonderful economic impact. We've heard already from Pam um, that you know, they are using their SNAP dollars. They're going back into the local economy. And we also know that when the first two weeks of the month, most of the SNAP dollars are getting used. Mm -hmm. By the end of the month, I believe uh, the USDA states that 97% of SNAP benefits are completely used. That means there's not waste in this program. People are using it, and they're using it quicker than they can get it. Um, with Pam's data that we might be able to see, you can see how much do they start using cash towards the end of the month to help supplement what SNAP or WIC or any other form of incentive payment couldn't. And that seems to push back somewhat because there's yeah. the waste argument, and there's also often a fraud argument. Mm -hmm. But people are now, we know people are reaching into their pockets mm -hmm. as well. 
Yeah, and that's, mm -hmm. and that's great to hear these stories. And mm -hmm. um, we had Aaliyah here earlier, mm -hmm. and the fact that um, I am hearing the same story that she is experiencing in DC, as a researcher, that makes me feel I'm not happy that the outcome, but I am happy to see that the same stories I hear in North Carolina are the same someone in DC is experiencing. So what this shows is it's not just one area, it's not your neighborhood, it's not just your state that we're failing. It's, we're having a systematic issue throughout the country that we need to address. Um, with SNAP, going back to what we do know, we do know that SNAP reduces food insecurity. We also know in the public health literature that obesity is linked with food insecurity. Mm -hmm. So right. from my connecting the dots, mm -hmm. I would want to think that if we invest in SNAP programs, we're going to reduce food insecurity and maybe we start addressing obesity prevention. Mm -hmm. Great. And data, evidence, what yeah. works is all of that is about focusing on these issues so we can increase our evidence base, continue to put resources into those things that we know are working mm -hmm. and refine them so that mm -hmm. we can get the improved health outcomes we've yeah. talked about, the economic benefits that we've talked about, and the strengthening of communities and economic mobility that we're all hoping for and working toward. Mm -hmm. At this point, I know we want to take some questions from Twitter and find out what the Twitterverse um, and others want to, want to ask you. Thanks so much, Melody. Uh, we want to remind our viewers at home to please submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag SnapInnovation. We already have a couple of questions, and then I'll turn it back to you, Melody. Our first question is, how do SNAP incentives programs help support local farmers and producers? So who wants to um, what these SNAP incentives do is open up entire new markets to farmers that farmers are not accessing in the first place. Um, one of the reasons that we are in the neighborhoods that we're in is because farmers won't go there. Farmers won't go there not for safety, but because they need to make about 1000 to $1,500 per outing to make it worth their while to set up a new market stand. They're not going to make that in the neighborhoods that we're serving, at least not yet. We are building each of those markets to that point. But this is income that the farmer can't otherwise get. And so by buying the food from them and bringing and taking care of that distribution and bringing it in and then offering SNAP incentives, you open up a whole market. One of the things that um, we sort of don't talk about, but I think is a hard reality of our food system, is that healthy food in general is more expensive. And I'm not sure that we can really address this without continuing to um, have incentives and, and without adding to them. People don't have enough money to eat healthy. And if they don't have enough money to eat healthy food, then we're, we have all kinds of really negative health consequences. And that ends up costing everybody mm -hmm. because those people are going into public hospitals and they're using Medicaid and we all pay for it in the end. So I'd much rather see us paying for it up front. Right. Farmers should be paid a fair price for the food that they grow. And if food is cheap, you need to ask the question, why is that food so cheap? Mm -hmm. We need to start valuing food, and we need to value the impact that food has on people's lives. I think that without addressing the food problem, you can't address poverty. Um, I think that you have to address poverty in order to fix the food problem, but it all has to happen right. together. Uh, and I would just add that um, you know many small farmers in America are struggling as well. They could be one bad season away from being on SNAP. So mm -hmm. SNAP incentives is a, a great way to help both rural farmers um, and SNAP customers. Mm -hmm. Great point. Good point. Great. Our next question is: Where does the funding for SNAP incentives come from, and what role does the Farm Bill play? Uh, well, for um, our program, when we started it five years ago, it was funded through the Philadelphia uh, Health Department. Um, but over the years, we've been able to also engage a lot of private sector uh, funders as well. So small family foundations have found this idea a um, very attractive one, that they can really help folks who are struggling to feed their families healthy food by contributing to this, uh, to this great program, Philly Food Bucks. Um, now, with uh, the last Farm Bill in 2014, USDA has invested $100 million to expand these programs uh, nationwide. Almost all of our incentives, all of our incentives are um, privately funded either through individual donors or from foundations who see the value of incentives. And we have some interesting stuff happening. Mm -hmm. we, not, we don't just um, double the value of SNAP for fruits and vegetables. We also do it for clean proteins. Mm -hmm. All of our food is grass-fed and pastured. When um, low-income people are eating, they're mostly eating in that beige center. They're having lots <laughs> of noodles and potatoes and cheap stuff. Um, we want them to have fruits and vegetables, but we also want the ha them to have clean proteins 
in organic milk. And so we offer our bonus bucks for that. And one of our funders is a, um, a paleo catering company who believes strongly that everyone should have access to clean, grass-fed, and pastured meats. And so they, every year, give us a sizable donation to match SNAP for proteins. That's great. I mean, I, I, you've drawn an important point. We often use the phrase fresh fruits and vegetables, but it is also about those clean and healthy proteins um, as well. It's a complete, it's a complete meal. Mm -hmm. So we've heard about Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. Uh, where else is this work happening? Michigan is one of the, um, through the Fair Food Network, is, is one of the real pioneers in this. And a number of years ago, Erin Hesterman um, did uh, bonus bucks uh, like you guys, or double dollar program. And one of the things that he found is that when he doubled the value at the farmer's market of food stamps, the amount of food that people bought went up not by 100%, by almost 300%. Mm -hmm. So it, the incentive, again, causes people to A, come out to the market, and then B, reach into their pockets to buy more. So Michigan is a real leader in this. California has a really strong state program. But with Finney, it's now nationwide. Um, not every farmer's market gets the money through Finney. You have to apply through a USDA grant. We have it in Virginia. Um, but it's, it's a new tranche of money that is really exciting to have access to because your donors get a little sick of you asking every year. <laughs> <laughs> and these type of, I guess, these innovative programs we're actually seeing um, across the country. Now, some of them are more publicized, and you might see them in a newspaper or a report, um, but I just I encourage people to actually look around their neighborhood mm -hmm. and start asking questions and seeing what's happening. Um, there are uh, a Union of Concerned Scientists. We're going to be releasing a report in a couple months that is actually going to spotlight several different innovative programs that are working right. with, you know, what policies are working, what programs are working, and how are local communities pulling their resources together to really serve the needs of everybody in the community. Um, going back to the data piece, I guess I, I was asked to talk about that. Um, I will, again, try to push for trying to figure out where more of these, these evidence is and where's the data and trying to figure out how you can assist nonprofits to gather this information because like you said, a lot of this originally is pen and paper. I mean, it's pen and pencil. I mean, you are writing it down, you're crossing off a list, and it's hard to figure out how to find something that somebody else in DC can maybe look at and try to figure out how you're going. I mean, Philadelphia, you've been doing this for a while, so I think you have some very rich data that you can go off of. But in cities that this is new, and communities this is new, um, I would really encourage us to find ways to, to introduce how we can mm -hmm. gather this information and, and evaluate it widespread. Right, and disseminate it. Mm -hmm. And I know here, is it the Produce Plus program is a great example of the kind of program that yeah. you want more people to know about. Yeah, Washington, D.C., the city council started this last year. It's an incredible program. It's a voucher program for fresh fruits and vegetables that you can redeem at any farmer's market in the city. You can get one every time you go to the farmer's market. We have something like 45 markets in D.C., so if you had the time and a bike, you could get around and get $450 in fresh fruits and vegetables every summer. It is um, a really profoundly innovative and interesting um, program that has um, an incredible impact. In D.C., I think there's maybe under $40,000 in SNAP funds spent at farmers markets, but the Produce Plus program is going to be in excess of $200,000, and they will spend every single penny of it. Mm -hmm. It introduces people to the farmers market that otherwise wouldn't come. Farmers markets require a really empowered customer. Mm -hmm. You go up, you don't know what the food is going to cost. The farmer's likely to engage you in a conversation about what you're going to cook. Mm -hmm. This is a scary thing. Um, even if you're not low income. If you're low income and you don't know if you're going to be able to pay that bill when the food gets weighed and you find out how much it costs and then somebody's asking you how you're going to cook it and maybe you don't know, that's a, that's a pretty high barrier. So there's a lot of people who don't even bother. But Produce Plus is bringing them out of the woodwork, um, the lines that we have. People will stand in line for an hour to get $10 in, fr in free fruits and vegetables, which is exciting and also heartbreaking. The need is huge. When we talk about our bonus bucks program, I always say, if you give us $10, we'll give you $20 in food. One of my customers went out and explained um, to her neighbors who asked if they were giving away free food at the market, and she said, no, you have to spend your SNAP. But if you spend a dollar, they'll give you $2 in food. And that, to me, is heartbreaking. If that is the level of need and if that is how people are micromanaging their food budgets, something has to change. And the SNAP incentives are a huge, huge uh, way of, of changing that conversation. Right. And I think another piece of this, and I touched on it in the beginning, because these are tools to try and create greater access, something mm -hmm. we've talked about. 
At the same time, you've seen these stories pop up in the news that there are efforts to create greater hurdles to access to SNAP and to, to these innovative tools, you know, whether it be drug testing and other hurdles because people have a particular perception of those who are using um, this, this program and these kinds of incentives. And I was wondering if you all could touch on that through the evidence lens mm -hmm. and those, the, the barriers that mm -hmm. uh, some people are, and policymakers and candidates are talking about and trying to deploy. Uh -huh. I mean, I'll jump in and just say that as far as I know, I have not seen any data that supports having an individual, you know, go through a drug test to get uh, supplemental nutrition assistance program benefits actually works. Mm -hmm. um, I would love for someone to show me that there is a study or data that, that supports it, but as of right, as of right now, there, there's nothing that I know that would actually say that. Three quarters of the people who use SNAP um, have in their home a senior citizen or a child, which mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why their food bill is higher than what they can afford. A quarter of our country's service members are using SNAP. Um, I think the, the vast majority of people are on SNAP for something less than a year, and it truly is a bridge between um, jobs and an income bridge. And, and it just seems super mean-spirited and um, just fraught with, um, fraught with judgment and, um, and, and a real false sense of moral superiority uh, to, su to suggest that just because somebody needs some um, income help that they're somehow you know, abusing the system and, and abusing drugs. Um, and, and I think that you know, what people would say is there are plenty of government programs that send plenty of money to other people for other reasons and we don't drug test them. Well, I was just gonna say in Pennsylvania, our new governor Wolf just got rid of something called the SNAP asset test which was great because that was, a, that was uh, just more paperwork. It's, you know, if someone on SNAP owns a car, um, that becomes a, a barrier, just as you said. Um, and, and as uh, Pam was saying, people are on SNAP for a short amount of time. We don't have to have everybody kind of, you know, selling their car. A lot of people are working on SNAP. They need their car. Um, and then the data showed that, you know, this was actually costing more to government to, to go through all the paperwork, so. Well, so for all of the reasons, and you all were talking about evidence and data, and the fact that this has been a bipartisan issue for so long, that we want to make sure that we continue to use that data and evidence lens to continue to support that the bipartisan coalition that has, mm -hmm. has supported these efforts uh, as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you all for being such a terrific panel. And before I close, though, I want to uh, bestow an honor um, mm -hmm. on Food Trust and Arcadia, the Arcadia Center as well. You know, as you know, Results for America focuses on what works and evidence-based policy making and those who are leaders all over the country who are supporting those efforts. And this is much in the spirit, I don't know if you all have seen the movie Moneyball mm -hmm. about Billy Bean and the Oakland A's mm -hmm. and using data and evidence to get that winning team. And that's what you all are doing as well. So we want to add the Food Trust and the Arcadia Center to the nonprofit Moneyball All-Stars. So thank you for your good work. Thanks. Lindsay, thank you for the terrific work that you're doing at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And thank you all for being with us this afternoon. Thank you for doing this. Thanks so much. Great.